Okay, welcome back to calculus. We're going to take a look at the uh, remainder of the material that I want to cover with you guys in section 11.1. We're going to look at sequence limit laws. So we're basically just going to try to practice getting better at computing limits of sequences here. Uh, you can see the goals of the lecture there. I've got four things I want to do. I want to give a, a rigorous definition of what I mean by a limit of a sequence. Then we'll look at some limit laws for sequences. I want to do several examples, and then I want to discuss a very specific limit towards the end of this uh, uh, video, and that's the limit uh, of a geometric sequence where you just take a number and keep raising the powers of it. Okay, it's going to be important for us in, in section 11.2. Um, I'm trying to keep these videos short, but uh, I got a lot to say in this one. I have a feeling it might end up being uh, more than a half an hour, so watch it in chunks, okay? Try to, try to watch it in 15-minute chunks, digest what I'm saying, and come back and then meet me in class and we can clarify. Okay, so let's go here. Uh, I've got an informal and a formal definition <clears throat> of limit here for us. So the informal one we've already used, so let's just kind of talk about it. So, you know, I'm given some sequence. You're used to the notation now. It's a sub n, n goes from 1 to infinity. So what do I mean when I write that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is l? I just mean that those sequence terms, those a sub n's, are going to become closer and closer to that number L, uh, the bigger and bigger N gets. All right. So we looked at pictures like that uh, in the first part of this section. You know, as you read the graph, if the dots on the graph were getting closer and closer to some Y value, some L, then, it, then the sequence had a limit. If they're not, it doesn't have a limit. Okay, well, all I need to do to make that rigorous is I just need to kind of say what I mean by these not so rigorous terms like closer and closer and bigger and bigger, right? Those aren't really mathematically rigorous terms. Uh, so how do we quantify those things rigorously? Well, here's how we do it. So the formal definition of limit means if, if you're saying some sequence has a limit L, then it means that for every number epsilon that you pick, Think of it as some tolerance. It's the distance away from the limit. So, so that you're imagining it's small. This is the Greek letter epsilon. So for every positive epsilon, you can find a number, a number n, so that if you go out past that number in the sequence, you look out the list past that number, your sequence terms will all stay within epsilon away from L. So the absolute value of the difference between two numbers, just read this as the distance between. This is the distance from a sub n to l, and that distance has to be less than epsilon. So I stole this picture from your book. It's showing you a picture of a sequence. Those are the red dots in this picture. And you can see that there's the line uh, y equals l. Uh, I'll just accentuate it over there. And then what they've drawn is for a positive number epsilon, two other over vertical lines. I don't have to write them. They already did. They've subtracted epsilon from l, and they've added epsilon to l. So this limit definition means that if this limit is l, then eventually, somewhere in this picture, they drew it like there, the sequence dots stay within epsilon of the limit, right? So those red dots are not going to leave the band that is bounded above by L plus epsilon and bounded below by L minus epsilon, all right? Let's look at it an example. That's, that's a lot to swallow. Let's look at an example. Um, this is an example that we did from the last time. Maybe you can pause the video real quick. Do you know this limit? We looked at it last time. What's going to happen to the fraction 1 over n as n becomes huge? We looked at it last time, and we proved that that limit is 0, right? So I want to switch over to Mathematica and illustrate this this static picture, uh, uh, because if this limit is 0, it means given any epsilon, that we should be able to find n big enough to where our sequence terms are within epsilon from zero. So let me switch over to uh, Mathematica and show you uh, a little demonstration of that fact. Okay, so now you can see my Mathematica screen. And what have I got here? I've drawn uh, the sequence uh, 1 over n. We looked at it last time, so that's what these dots are. And then I've got a, a slider up here called epsilon. Right now, epsilon is equal to 1, so you can see that red line. And, and what have I done? I've added, because the limit is supposed to be 0, I've added 1 to 0, and I've subtracted 1 from 0. So, so that band is now uh, 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 how wide it is when epsilon is 1. 
And you can see in this picture that, that as soon as n gets to one, uh, 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 we'd stay inside that band. All right, but, but epsilon equals one is pretty big. Maybe you want me to make epsilon equal to a half. Okay, there. Epsilon is now a half, so I've got a half above one and a half below, or sorry, half above zero and a half below zero. And you can see that as soon as the uh, index, the capital N in this case would be a two. As soon as the index gets to two, the blue dots stay within the band. And then maybe, maybe you're uh, pushy, you say a half isn't good enough for me. Maybe I want epsilon to be a tenth. Okay, there's epsilon equal a tenth. If you can see my scale over there, they got it kind of smashed in. And sure enough, the dots don't make it in there, but eventually when capital N is 10, those dots enter the red band and they stay there. And what this demonstration, let's do one more, I've got a 0.05. If you want the epsilon tolerance to be 0.05, okay, you have to wait till the capital N is 20. But, but the whole point is, that no matter how small I make epsilon, those dots eventually enter that red band and they stay there. That's what I mean by a function having a limit. Okay, so let's switch back to the whiteboard here. Cool. Let's see if it's gonna come back. There we go. All right, so let's look at some limit laws. Uh, instead of writing these things out, I tried to make the video a little shorter. Maybe this handwriting is neater. If it's blurry on your screen, I just did this as a screenshot. I wasn't really thinking about resolution, but uh, I tried to give you a reference. I, I took this from, from your book. It's on page 6, 697 in your book in a better resolution. So, so what are these things? These are the usual laws that, that limits of functions held, yeah? I'm not even gonna say them all as we're talking, but they say things like, well, if you take two sequences that are both convergent, that is, they both have a, a, a limit, then uh, if you add them together, that sum would have a limit, and the limit would be the limit of the sums. And the same for differences and multiplying by numbers, products, fractions uh, as long as the denominator doesn't go to zero you can take powers uh, uh, at before and after the limit so you're used to all of these things with uh, with, with functions Let, let's look at an example let me try to leave that in view while we do this example I've written this thing uh, uh, just looking at it if, if it was a if, if n was a, a continuous variable x that's a rational function cubic over cubic you know the limit yeah, pause it and say it to yourself out loud. You know what this limit is. Let me just illustrate what, what I mean uh, using limit laws. So um, one, one way we would manipulate this thing if I wanna write out a bunch of steps, I would divide everything by the highest power of n and that would be dividing everything by n cubed. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to keep that. Um, so if I divide everything by n cubed in the numerator, I'd have a two, I'd have minus one over n squared, I'd have plus one over n cubed. In the denominator, I'd get three plus one over n squared uh, uh, plus one over n cubed. Yeah, and now looking at that, I'm not going to write it all, but here, um, uh, maybe I'll just erase my highlighting so you can see what I'm talking about as I go. Uh, I've got a limit of a fraction. Well, uh, this property tells me that the limit of a fraction is the fraction of the limits. So maybe I'll write one more step for you. Uh, uh, that thing would be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the numerator. Limit as n goes to infinity of the denominator. I'm not suggesting that you have to write all this out. Uh, again, you knew this limit a while ago. I'm just trying to illustrate, you're using these laws when you do stuff like that. I'm not gonna write the detail, but here uh, uh, I've got limit of a sum, limit of a difference, okay, push it through. So, so the short story is when you're looking at this thing, you can say, well, this thing is going to be two minus zero plus zero because those limits uh, are equal to that in the numerator. In the denominator, you get three plus zero plus zero. And so you wrote it down a while ago, that limit is two thirds. So that theorem that you use when you just looked at these uh, uh, coefficients and wrote the limit down because the degrees were equal, uh, uh, you're using limit laws when you use that theorem. Yeah, so, so, so all those limit laws that you use for uh, functions, they all hold for sequences too. Cool. Uh, oh, we could switch over if you, if you want uh, uh, to the Mathematica screen real quick. 
let me do it because I can just show you one more time for this limit. Uh, I've got it all prepped up. Uh, uh, what we just did, we can look at it kind of visually. All right. So here uh, I've graphed that sequence. It's too long to say it, but it's that, that cubic uh, polynomial divided by itself. We wrote that the limit was two thirds. So I, I didn't draw the vertical line at two thirds here, but I've got an epsilon band around it and I can shrink that epsilon band and you can see that uh, uh, for any value of epsilon, as skinny as I make this band, it's true that eventually the dots enter that band and stay there. And this band is shrinking down around two thirds. Yeah, so there's a visual demonstration of the limit that we just calculated algebraically. Hopefully you checked out, I made a new video um, showing you how to plot sequences in Desmos where you can actually see the screen. Uh, and I hope, you, I hope you'll bounce all this, uh, take advantage of our online world here and do a lot more visualization than you would in, in a classroom. Okay, so let's just keep moving here. Uh, maybe you wanna pause, I'm talking fast. I don't know how long we are into this thing, but uh, if you're getting tired, just pause it and come back. Okay, I'm not gonna pause, I'm gonna plow on. So we, you remember the squeeze theorem for functions? This, there's also a squeeze theorem for sequences. It says that if you take three sequences, A, B, and C, uh, uh, and the terms for the, the sequence B are always between the ones for A and C, and the outer ones, A and C, have the same limit, uh, then B is going to have that limit. You're squeezed in between there. Yeah. Uh, uh, before I scroll down, there's, there's another theorem uh, uh, that if you take the absolute value of something and its limit is zero, then the something has to go to zero. That can be kind of a handy theorem. Let me, let me illustrate both of these with a couple of examples. Uh, I think I'm going to actually uh, illustrate with uh, uh, this Theorem six, that's taken from your book. You can see it on page 698 in your book. I'm gonna do that first, actually. I've got an example down here. Maybe I wanna know what the limit of this sequence is. It's a sequence minus one to the N divided by N. Well, uh, the absolute value of minus one to the N divided by N is just one over N. Yeah, because the absolute value would erase the minus signs. And the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is 0. We've proven it in this lecture, or we've looked at it in this lecture today. We looked at it last time. So this limit is 0 by that theorem. I'm only citing it by number here because uh, uh, we were just looking at it. You don't have to cite theorems by number, but I'm using theorem 6 to make that conclusion. Okay? Sorry, I should have put these in the other order, but let's, let's look at example 3 now. Uh, I want to use the squeeze theorem to calculate this. Why the squeeze theorem? Well, because the sine of any angle is always between uh, minus one and one. So if we multiply everything by one over n, then we can realize our sequence terms, our sine n over n is bounded between minus one over n and one over n, yeah? So if you want me to match the uh, uh, notation in the theorem, these are my a sub n's, these are my c sub n's, and the sequence that I wanted was my b sub n's, and I've got the condition, okay? Let me scroll back up here. The condition was that you have to have uh, uh, b sub n always between a sub n and c sub n. And then what about this condition? Uh, I think it's true too, yeah, because minus one over n, sorry about that, um, minus one over n and um, one over n have the same limit, all right? These guys have the same limit. So, uh, and, and in particular, they go to uh, the limit as, let me just, sorry, I'm stumbling here. The limit as one over, as n goes to infinity of one over n is zero. So is the limit as n goes to infinity of minus one over n, it's also zero. So this is zero by the squeeze theorem. Nice, right? It has to because it's trapped between two things, both of which are going to zero. Let's look at a picture of this. This will be, I think, our last uh, journey over to Mathematica. I don't have an epsilon band to show you here, but uh, I do want to show you what this sequence looks like. So here I've plotted the first 20 terms of it. 
This is the sequence if you can read in the Mathematica code, it's sine of n over n. I've got the first 20 terms of it. And notice that like our other examples, these aren't always just dropping or rising, they're doing both. It's a sine function. They drop for a while, they rise for a while. They drop for a while, they rise for a while. But they're dropping and rising less and less. I mean, I think this picture is convincing that they converge to zero. Um, let's look at, uh, now we can look at the first 50 terms. Yeah, maybe that's a little too small for you to see the detail. But it's, yeah, this thing is rising and falling less and less. If I drew the bounding curves, what have I drawn in this picture? I've drawn, well, I drew it continuously so that it's easier to see. This is one over X, that curve. This is minus one over X. And the fact that those dots stay in between those things is, is a visual demonstration of those inequalities that we had on our, on our whiteboard that sine of n over n is less than or equal to one over n, but it's greater than or equal to minus one over n. It stays in between there, right? So there you're seeing the squeeze theorem. Look, if the, the, the black lines, the black curves are both going to zero, the dots are stuck between them, the dots are going to zero too. That's what the squeeze theorem says. Here, I'm gonna uh, just give you a little bit of eye candy. Uh, you can see down here, I plotted the same thing, but out uh, to 20,000 sequence points. So it's gonna smash the X scale quite a little bit, but it's kind of a visually interesting picture. Uh, I like it. Notice on the Y scale here, we are really zoomed into zero. Yeah, that's, that's four ten thousandths and minus four ten thousandths. So, so you're looking at a really thin little strip of the Y axis there. And these patterns, they're kind of an illusion in some sense because of the way we're smashing the X scale. But, but I like this picture when, when my eye look at it, uh, excited, I, I almost see some depth. It almost looks like it's like a 3D picture. But that's just the uh, first 20,000 uh, elements of the sequence sine of N over N. Uh, 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 and it's showing you that they're squeezed in between one over N and minus one over N. Okay, so I hope you like that. Uh, let's get back to work. Feeling tired? Take a break. There's patches. Uh, uh, good, back to work. One more useful theorem. One more useful theorem that you can interchange limit with continuous functions. This kind of looks intimidating, but if you have some sequence that has a limit L, and then you have a continuous function at L, then uh, if you take the limit of the function's value at your sequence terms, you have to get the function's value at L. So, so I, I look at that formula saying that you can interchange limit and the function. If I kind of write in here, um, say from this side, uh, uh, just a slightly different way, it's saying that that thing equals F of the limit of a n, yeah, because that's what L is. So you can do the limit after or before you take the function value. So here I've got an example five set up for it here. I've got the, the limit as n goes to infinity of sine of uh, pi over n. Sine is a continuous function. So that theorem up there says that I can take the limit of pi over n as n goes to infinity first, then take the sine of that. Okay, well, the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n is zero, yeah? And the sine of zero is zero. So that's a handy theorem. We just use theorem seven to calculate the limit of the sine. So you can do that for any continuous function. Here, I've got one more example. Lots of your homework uh, uh, I assigned like problem 23, 24, 25. They, they're using these limit laws. They're, they're kind of drill problems like this. Let's do one more. Uh, uh, what's the deal this time? The continuous function is the square root. So uh, uh, that theorem seven up there, again, you don't have to justify it. I'm just trying to make good notes. Theorem seven says that you can take the limit of one plus four n squared over n squared first, then take its square root. And by that previous technique, what is the limit uh, of that uh, rat, rat, rat ratio? Uh, uh, the, <laughs> my, I'm tripping on my tongue. Uh, the exponents are both two, so it's the ratio of the leading terms. So we're just gonna get four over one. Yeah, that's the square root of four. That's two, there, finally spit it out. 
So there's a couple of examples illustrating how you can use that continuous function theorem. Okay, this is a middle long one, uh, uh, last topic, and I'm not gonna prove these statements here, but I just, I, I need to put this out on the table. Um, it's a special kind of sequence. It's called the geometric sequence. Maybe I can just write down below a couple of specific values of R. Like if I took R to be say two, then the sequence two to the n, we've already looked at that one. Uh, it would have a two, it would have two squared, it would have two to be cubed, it would have two to the fourth power and so on. So two to the n, uh, it's called a, a geometric sequence. Um, geometric sequence has the property that uh, the ratio of any two uh, consecutive terms is a constant. In this case, it would be the constant two. Uh, uh, let's look at uh, another one. Uh, if we looked at, say, one half to the n, when you take powers of a number like one half, well, you get one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, and so on. You get one over two to the n or one half to the n. Uh, uh, notice that that first sequence is divergent. Yeah, its, it's terms are blowing up. The second one looks like it's converging to zero. That's just sort of a shorthand for writing limits. You can read that arrow as converging to zero. So that's what my little fact up here says, is that if you take any number r, any number on the number line, if you take r to be uh, uh, between um, minus one and one strictly, so I'm writing that as its absolute value is less than one, or r equal to one itself, then that sequence will converge. Yeah, powers of numbers that are less than one converge to zero. So I've drawn that in this picture down here, just showing you uh, the interval where it converges. It includes one, but not minus one. If R is any other value, minus one or some number bigger than one in absolute value, this, this sequence, this geometric sequence is gonna diverge. And uh, I'm not gonna give a proof of that in this video. I'll try to keep it short. You can ask me about it in class, but these two examples kind of illustrate what's going on. Uh, uh, you take a number bigger than one uh, uh, and you start taking powers of it, well, the powers just get bigger and bigger. And if the number's less than one or minus one, then, then it's gonna do that plus alternate in sign. But if you take a number less than one, well, then its powers uh, get smaller and smaller because uh, multiplying by a number less than one reduces the size. Okay, well, I hope you made it through that lecture and I will see you in a Zoom meeting soon.